We are in part two of a series today called Can't Find My Keys. I can't find my keys. Some of you been there. You know what I'm talking about. Like you can't find your keys. And when you can't find your keys, you feel powerless. You feel like you're helpless. You feel like you can't get accomplished what you need to accomplish. And if you weren't here last week, I challenge you, go back, listen to the message last week because I talk about the keys that Jesus has given us, the authority that Jesus has given us to win, to unlock victory while we're here on the earth. Listen, I don't want to be that guy that gets to heaven someday and God says, hey, come here, I want to show you something. And he opens up a room and there's all this really cool stuff. And I'm like, what is all this? And he says, that's the stuff you could have had. This is all the stuff you could have had while you were on earth, but you didn't understand what my word said. You didn't understand what authority you had. And so you didn't get any of it. And so there's a lot of Christians that are walking this earth and they're beat down, they're tired, they're beat up, they're depressed, they're miserable, and they sing that, oh, I just can't wait till I get to heaven. Listen, Jesus gave us authority for things on this earth. And you don't have to walk around being beat down all the time. And so today, I'm going to teach a hard subject. We're in this line of authority So we're teaching this thing on authority, and what I'm going to talk about today goes right along with it. And so many of you, when I get ready to tell you what it is, your butt's going to pucker, you're going to get nervous, and you're like, I don't like to talk about that stuff. But here's the deal, you don't understand authority if that's how you react, all right? So just hang on, today's subject in some churches is a hard subject. This church, it's not. And it shouldn't be a hard subject in any church that's full of believers of Jesus, that are followers of Jesus. All right, we're going to talk about demonic influence today. Demonic influence today. Did you hear that little... Like it shouldn't be that way. Like we should hear, like we're going to learn how to destroy Satan as demons today. And people are like, yes. But instead it's like, butt pucker, start sweating. Like literally, I'm, I'm, I'm purposely looking through the room because I've taught on demons before and seen people get up and walk out because they don't believe in demons. And I'm like, whoop, there goes somebody that's defeated. Whoop, there goes somebody that's getting their butt kicked this week. So here's the deal. Today, I want to completely destroy any thought or belief in this church of a lie that has crept into all churches today. And here's the lie that Satan that the devil, that demons, that they can't mess with, they can't influence, they can't demonize, they can't possess Christians. All right? It's a lie straight from the pit of hell. It's the biggest pile of caca doo-doo I've ever heard in my life. These people that walk around that call themselves Christians say, oh, the devil can't mess with me. Oh, the devil can't bother me. I'm a Christian. I'm going to completely destroy that today if you're sitting in this place. I'm just warning you. So if you're here and you've been taught that and you believe, well, the devil can't touch me because I'm I'm a follower of Jesus. You've been lied to and I'm getting ready to rip the rug out from underneath of you and show you that the devil can mess with you. But here's the great thing. You have the keys, the authority to beat him to fight against him and win. So, here we go. Matthew chapter 4. It's not on on the screens today. We see a story where Jesus goes into the wilderness. For 40 days, he had nothing to eat, nothing to drink. Can you even imagine? 40 days, no food, no water. And then it says, the devil comes and attacks him. The devil comes and attacks Jesus. What makes you think Because you're a Christian, the devil can't mess with you. The devil messed with Jesus. Are you better than Jesus? Like, if you've believed that lie that the devil can't mess with you, you are sadly mistaken. Last week I said, let's look at this message, this passage out of Matthew. And so we're going to look at it again. And then I want to read a little bit farther for you. Matthew chapter 16, verse 15. Jesus asked his disciples, he says, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter said, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, you're blessed, Simon, son of John, because my father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock. And upon this rock, I will build my church and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. 
Whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven, and whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. Jesus just gives Peter this great big pat on the back. Way to go, Peter. Great answer. You're correct. And because you have received this revelation that I am the Son of the living God, that I am the Savior of the world, I'm going to build my church upon that confession. I'm going to build my, my church upon that idea that I am the Savior of the world. And those who believe that, those who follow that, I'm going to give them the keys to the kingdom of heaven. What's the kingdom of heaven? It's the power of God at work here on earth. That's what it is. That's the kingdom of heaven. It's the power of God alive and working here on earth. It's pretty powerful stuff. But now let's look a little further. Matthew chapter 16. We're just going down a few verses. We stopped in verse 19. Let's go to verse 21. From then on, Jesus began to tell his disciples plainly that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem and that he would suffer many terrible things at the hand of the elders, the leading priests, and the teachers of the religious law. He would be killed, but on the third day he would be raised from the dead. But Peter... This is the same guy that just had the revelation a couple verses ago that Jesus was the Son of God. But Peter took him aside and began to reprimand him for saying such things. Can you imagine reprimanding Jesus? Jesus, listen, I know I just saw you like bring that guy back to life. I mean, he was dead, and I, that's cool. And I just saw you bring like 25 gallons of water and turn it into wine. That's awesome, but listen, you're missing the mark on this, dude. Like, could you just imagine this conversation? But it says he reprimanded him and he says, heaven forbid, Lord, this will never happen to you. But Jesus turned to Peter and he said, get away from me, Satan. You are a dangerous trap to me. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's point. How is it that Peter goes from this great godly man with this incredible insight from the Holy Spirit to now this man who Jesus says is Satan? It's what he says. He says, get away from me, Satan. Like, I'm not going to listen to that, Peter. That is straight from the pits of hell. Yet we have churches full of Christians that say, well, Jesus, Jesus is my Savior, and therefore Satan can't touch me. The devil can't touch me. He can't bother me. He can't possess me. He can't influence me. Peter, the guy that Jesus said, I'm going to build my church upon what you just said, Satan attacks him. You're better than Peter, I guess. You're better than Peter. I mean, this statement is just so messed up. That, that whole lie that, that people will say, well, the demonic realm, it just, it just it, it can't affect me. It's so weird, and it doesn't line up with Scripture. Like, let me give you an example of like, how this would compare. To say, okay, unbelievers, people that don't follow Jesus, you can be attacked by demons, you can be attacked by Satan, Believers, people that follow Jesus, you can't be. Let me show you how stupid that sounds. When you put it in something like reality that we're used to seeing or feeling or some of you tasting, let's just say tonight we put some believers in a room, followers of Jesus, let's just say three guys, and we take three of their buddies who aren't followers of Jesus, and we say you guys have two hours to consume three kegs of beer. Like, drink it all, like, really fast. After it's over, we open the door, and the three guys that follow Jesus are like, doop de doop doo nope, no big deal. And the other guys are knee-walking drunk. You're like, that, that's, that's ridiculous, Rick. Like, everybody would be plastered. Exactly. Everybody would be under the influence of alcohol. But yet we have this idea that believers are all of a sudden away from the things of Satan. We can't be influenced. We can't be touched. Like what? Like when you put it in the sense of drinking a whole bunch of alcohol at the same time, you're like, well, that, that's ridiculous. Everybody in that room would just be plowed. They'd, all be, they'd, they'd just be crazy. Like they would all be drunk, like bad drunk. Yes, yes, they would. But yet we have this idea in church today that eh, Christians can't be messed with by demons. James 4, 7 in the NIV says, Submit yourself unto God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. I'm going to have him leave that up there just for a second because we need to break this verse down. Submit yourself then to God. That word submit is the word hupo tasso. Hupo tasso. In the original it means to put your rank under someone else's rank or to obey someone. 
You want to know how the devil and his demons have hoodwinked the church today? They have convinced Jesus' followers that they should just get whatever they want. They have convinced Jesus' followers that they need to be selfish. They need to believe and deserve that everything is for them. Well, I, I get what I want. When you get what you want, you don't put your rank under God's. You put your rank above God's. Well, God, I know you want this, but I want that, so I'm going to do it. Well, I, 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 don't, I don't care what your word says, God. I'm going to go ahead and do that. That's not submitting yourself to God. It's not. There's no submission. There's no obedience. There's no ranking underneath him. But then what does it say after that? Submit yourself to God. Put yourself under God. Live by way, the way God wants you to live. But then look what it says. Resist the devil. If Christians couldn't be messed with by Satan, why did God waste his breath by putting this in here? Like, come on, if we, if we just want to like look at things realistically, logically, with human reasoning, why, why would it even say that? If, if the devil can't mess with us, why would it say resist the devil? That word resist is the word anthistamia. That's what it means, to stand against, to withstand, or to set against. This resist the devil isn't this, oh, come on, leave me alone. No, it's to set yourself against. I remember back when I was doing the MMA and the fighting and stuff, we had this one guy who was a golden glove boxer from St. Louis that trained with us, and he outweighed me by about 20 pounds. And this dude, when he hits you, it felt like a horse kicking you. And we used to do these drills with pads where they would kick and punch the pad that you held. And I remember, like most guys in the class, I was the bigger fighter, and I would just hold the pad and just let him go to town, and I'd be like, mm, whatever, whatever. But when it came to Eric, like I set myself against him. I like set my feet like you're not knocking me over. And he would just, ugh, he would hit me so hard. That's what this word right here, resist, it means to set against, like dig in and say, no, not today, Satan. We have these cute little t-shirts, not today, Satan, but how many people really believe that? Like how many people set themselves against him and say, not today, Satan? Like we got to get this attitude, like we're pissed at the devil. No, I am tired of you robbing my health. I'm tired of you robbing my finances. I'm tired of you running my kids away from me. I'm tired of you ruining my job. I'm tired. Like, you've got to set yourself against the devil. The only way you and I are going to see freedom, the only way is if we find out this authority that we have that we can win in the spiritual realm against the devil. Let's look at another passage. Joel 2, 32. In the King James Version... Wow, he's going to King James. Whoo, Joe is so excited right now. It says, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. I'm going to stop right there. Does that sound familiar to anybody, that passage? Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Where's that at? Oh, wait, Romans chapter 10. What? Romans chapter 10, starting in verse 10, says, For it is by believing your heart that you are made right with God, and it is openly declaring your faith that you are saved. As the scripture tells us, anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Jew and Gentile are the same in this respect. They have the same Lord who gives generously to all who call on him. For, verse 13, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is in the Romans road. We have preached this for years. Listen, boys and girls, you want to go to heaven? All you got to do is trust in Jesus for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It's straight out of Joel 2.32. But you remember, you know, did you notice the difference? Joel 2.32 says everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. We, we, we can't talk about casting out demons, Rick. That's like deliverance. Like we can't talk about deliverance. Do you realize part of salvation is you being set free from demons? Like everywhere Jesus went, he cast demons out of people. His deliverance ministry was stronger and more aggressive than his healing ministry. Like everywhere Jesus went, he cast demons out of people. Everywhere. But yeah, we can't talk about demons in church. We can't talk about people being influenced by demons. I'm telling you, if you believe that, 
then you have bought into a lie of the enemy. These people that go to churches and they say, oh, we can't talk about demons, and they leave or they get uncomfortable, those are the ones that have listened to a lie and the devil is wrecking their life. They don't realize it because they just think, oh, well, it's just life. Things happen. There are so many scriptures on demons. There are so many scriptures on how to deal with demons. How Jesus dealt with demons. Be it, oh, we can't talk about it in church. Listen, if you are a pastor and you are listening to me right now by way of Facebook or YouTube, how dare you cripple your congregation? How dare you kill your congregation and not teach them about a demonic fight? I had a lady call me at 9.30 last Wednesday night. She had got home from her church service and she was very upset and she texted me and she said, can I call you? And I said, of course you can. And so I sat outside and I talked to her for almost an hour. She came to the tent revival in Richland and that's where she got my phone number. She went to her pastor and she said, listen, I really believe there's some demonic stuff going on in my life. And I need help. I need help navigating it. And I need help to get out of it and lead other people out of it. This is what he said. You probably need to find a pastor or a church that can help you. Yeah, does that piss anybody off besides me? I was so, I was furious. Like I wanted to drive down to the church, knock on the door and go in and talk to the guy. Get your butt out of bed. We got to talk. You're killing your congregation. She come to him and says, and that, listen, listen, some of you are like, oh, it must have been one. It was a charismatic church right down here in Camdenton. All right? It's not like it was way far away. And they, like, they say they believe in all the things of the Holy Ghost. What? Like, I was so mad. What are we doing as followers of Jesus by ignoring this subject? All we're doing, here's what it is. All we're doing is we're pushing people farther into bondage. Like until we start to, and listen, if you're like uncomfortable with this, I'm just telling you, get ready. Because I've been praying and I've been studying and I've been seeing all kinds of things. And God is doing a move right now in the United States in deliverance ministry. Like there are hundreds of churches that are experiencing this in their congregations. People getting set free. Demons manifesting in service. People getting set free from those demons. And some of you are like, that makes me really uncomfortable. Well, then you're not going to like heaven. Like, that's where the supernatural lives. It's supernatural. Let me show you how we're supposed to handle demons. Here we go, Mark chapter 1, verse 21. Here's how we handle demons. Jesus and his companions went to the town of Capernaum. When the Sabbath day came, he went to the synagogue and he began to teach. And the people were amazed at his teaching. For he taught with real authority, hello, quite unlike the teachers of religious law. Anybody know any religious churches around that when they teach there's no authority? Suddenly a man in the synagogue who was possessed by an evil spirit cried out, Why are you interfering with us, Jesus of Nazareth? I don't know why I made that voice, but that's what they sound like, I guess. I mean, here's how some of them sound. Have you come to destroy us? I had a 13-year-old girl talk like James Earl Jones once. I was like, whoa. Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Jesus reprimanded him. Be quiet. Now notice who he reprimanded. It says the evil spirit cried out. Not the man, the evil spirit. Jesus reprimanded him, the evil spirit. Be quiet and come out of the man, he ordered. At that, the evil spirit screamed, threw the man into a convulsion, and then came out of him. Amazement gripped the audience, and they began to discuss, what has happened? What sort of new teaching is this? They said excitedly, it, was, it has such authority... Even evil spirits obey his orders. You get that? When you start walking in authority, evil spirits will obey you. It says the news about Jesus spread quickly throughout the entire region of Galilee. How do we cast out demons in the church today? Here's what happened. Jesus let the man stay in church and he cast the demon out. Churches today kick the man out and let the demon stay in him. How are we supposed to do this? By the power of Jesus. 
That's it. It's not weird. It's not wonky. It's not crazy. It's supernatural. That's how we do this. We're getting ready to do this VBS thing, and we're going to be talking about the armor of God. The ladies' Bible study is getting ready to talk about the armor of God. I put in my notes, why do we put on the army, the armor? Why do we put on the armor? We put on the armor to fight the devil. Why in the world would we need the armor to fight the devil if the devil can't mess with us? Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 says, A final word, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Put on all God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all the strategies of your wife. <laughs> like we have churches that say, Oh, you got to put on the armor of God so you can be a good soldier for Jesus. We have churches that say, You have to put on the armor of God so you can fight against your flesh. It's not what it says. It says, so that you can stand firm against the devil. That's what it says. It says, for we are not fighting, verse 12, we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor, so here it is again, so you you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then, after the battle, you will be standing firm. You remember the word from earlier, that resist? Here it is again. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13. It says, therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to set yourself against the enemy. Listen to me, church. If you ever have the opportunity to teach on this passage, whether it is in kids' church or VBS or any other platform, please... For all that is holy, please don't lie to kids and tell them that the armor of God is so that they can be some good little soldier for Jesus. Don't lie to kids and say, oh, you got to put on the armor of God so you can fight your flesh. No. Paul makes it very clear. You put on the armor to fight the devil. Quit lying to kids and tell them the truth. Because if not, you're going to have churches grown up that believe, I don't need the armor to fight the devil, I need the armor to fight my bad thoughts or my flesh. It's not what he says. The devil wants to keep us in this arena of reason. Well, Rick, it didn't work that way for my mom. Well, Rick, it didn't work that way for my Uncle George. Well, Rick, it didn't work that way for Aunt Betty. And we start reasoning things over in our mind of the natural stuff that happens and we take the supernatural and we throw it out the window. 2 Corinthians 10 verse 4 and the New King King James says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Jesus. That word, arguments, casting down arguments, in the King James, it's the word imagination. But if you look it up in the the original, it's human reasoning. If you are here right now and you are a reasoner, you're having a hard time with demons. If you're one of those logical thinkers... Like it's got to sit in a certain box and it's got to look a certain way and one plus one has to equal two and if there's a penny missing out of my checkbook, like we got to call the bank. Like if you're one of those type A organized logical thinkers that are human reasoners, the supernatural stuff is hard for you because it doesn't look right. It doesn't make sense. When you see someone's face twist and contort, you're like... That's not logical and you will leave because of your human reasoning. When you see someone bend over backwards and the top of their forehead touches their butt and you're like, that's impossible, Rick. Your body can't bend like that. I know, that's what I thought. And I watched this guy do it right in front of me. I was like, in Jesus' name, let go of that guy. Good night. And the demon come out and he went, Phew. And I was like, are you, are you feeling all right? Like, you're back Okay. Like when you see stuff like that, you're like, all human reasoning goes out the window. But if you're one of those people that are locked in, they're like, it's got to make sense. Listen, sometimes the supernatural doesn't make sense. Folks, I believe in America, the church is ready for a mass deliverance. 
But here's the problem. They're not ready for it. They're not ready for it. I had a pastor friend tell me this week, well, Rick, do you really believe that that casting out demons thing, do you really think it's a good idea to talk to the church about it? Because people aren't ready for that. What, do they have Jesus? Like if you have Jesus and you have a Bible, you're ready for it. Well, well, I haven't studied that, so go study it. Like, get going. Get on your horse and ride. Let's go. Like, I don't know how to, how to talk you into this other than it's all through Scripture that salvation is deliverance. And we can be set free from this stuff. I've got a testimony real quick. Come on up. Joe, you got your mic? Is it up here? Here, we'll just use Missy's mic. It's easier. I asked Jessica Wednesday night to show. Oh, look at her. She's got her paper and everything. Wow, Missy's mic is hot. Jessica's going to share what happened in her life this week. Okay, I'm super excited, but I'm also so nervous that I have sweat pumped through my shirt. <laughs> That's okay. We're going to do it anyway. That's okay. So... On Tuesday, Dakota and I, we got up, we did our Bible study, I took the kids to the babysitter, and then I went home for my prayer time before I headed into the office. So Dakota had brought home some olive oil a couple of months ago, and it was still in the pantry, and I thought, I'm going to get that down today, and I'm going to go through my house. So I separated it into this little cute jelly jar that I had, and I prayed that this anointing oil... <laughs> it's important, would be used for my household for healing, protection, and miracles for my family. So I started upstairs. I anointed every bedroom, every bed. I did the bathroom. I even said in my bathroom, anyone that walks in this bathroom will walk out in relief. And then... <laughs> some people have trouble with that. <laughs> Not at my house. Then I went downstairs, I did the kitchen door, the pantry, the fridge, the dining room, I went to the living room, I did my TV, the Wi-Fi box. I went downstairs and I did the same thing down there. Then I went to my front door and I finished off with the inside and I thought, oh heck, I'm gonna go outside and I'm gonna do my front storm door too. So I walked outside and then when I was out there, I prayed a hedge of protection over the four corners of my home, I prayed a spiritual hedge of protection, a physical hedge of protection, that anything in either realm that meant to steal, kill, destroy, or cause harm to my family would fall and fail in Jesus' name, that nothing could stand against. I pled the blood of Jesus over my home, and at the end, I prayed any enemy wouldn't even be able to cross a toe over the threshold of my home. And then I walked my happy rear end down my driveway, and I anointed the corner of my driveway and I prayed a hedge of protection around the four corners of my property and I prayed the same thing that any enemy wouldn't even be able to step over my driveway and then I walked across the road and I did my mailbox just in case. Okay? And then I went inside and I got ready for work and I forgot about it. I didn't even tell Dakota I did it. I just went to work. So that night we get in the bed, Dakota prays and we went to sleep. And I woke up to Cody Ryan talking in her sleep, and I could hear Chloe thrashing around in her bed, and they were getting attacked at the same time. And I literally laid there, and I got so mad, and I thought, you are joking me. The day I anoint my house, the day I anoint the beds, and say everybody's going to sleep in peace, you're going to come up here acting like a fool. And I literally got so mad, and I thought, Lord, if I go in there, it's going to be so ugly for them. And I thought, what time is it? And I looked, and it said 1.37 a.m., and all of a sudden, it just got quiet. And both of the girls stopped, and I'm like, ha-ha, suckers! Nice try, not in my house. And then I rolled over to go back to sleep. So Dakota, in the summertime, has to sleep with the window open. He likes the breeze and hearing the peepers and all that stuff. So I settle back in, and I lay down, and I hear gravel crunching. Somebody's walking down the gravel road, at 1.30 in the morning. And I literally thought, what idiot walks around at 1.30 in the morning on a gravel road? So I rolled over and I put my spectacles on so I could see who it was. And when I looked out the window, my jaw literally dropped. There was a figure about as tall as an average sized man. <laughs> and it was dressed in all black robes from the top of it all the way to the ground. And I mean, the whole thing was covered. And it was walking from one corner of where the front of our property line begins. And it was just walking down the front line of our yard. And it wasn't in a hurry. 
and it wasn't walking slow like it was trying to be creepy. It never stopped. All it could do was just walk by. And as it was walking down the driveway, I saw its robe was like dragging the ground. Not long like it didn't have a train, but just long enough going behind it that I could see the movement of the material as it was walking. And when it got to the opposite corner of that front line of our property, it disappeared and I could no longer hear the gravel crunching underneath it because it had to walk away and it couldn't come back. And when I realized what I had just seen, I began thanking God for his protection, for keeping his promises, for how cool he is. And then the next morning I went downstairs and I told Dakota, I can tell you what happened this morning. And I told him the day before I anointed our house and our driveway and what had just walked past our home. And he said, do you know what I'm studying about this morning? I'm like, no, what? So he reads his Bible on his phone and he turned it so I could see it. And it was Exodus 30 when God instructed Moses to make anointing oil for the temple and the priests. How cool is that? (laughs) That's it. That's all I got. Now, some of you see that and you're like, God, that poor Dakota. (laughs) Like, some of you need to get that attitude. The devil is wrecking your homes and you need to start acting like that. You're like, she's crazy, Rick. Yeah, she is crazy for Jesus. So like... That's, that's, we're going to have to become a body of believers that gets so mad at the devil for keeping our kids up at night with night terrors or bad dreams or whatever you want to call it. Like you're going to have to start getting this attitude, not today, Satan. And what I love about this is God confirmed it. He let her see into the spiritual realm that demonic figure that was walking her property line and she saw the power of what she did. That thing couldn't step over the property line. And when it got to the end of the property line, it was gone. Come on, people. This is real. This fight that we are in is real. Let's all stand. Here's what we're going to do. Missy's going to come and she's going to minister on the piano for a second. And we're going to just throw something out there today. I don't know what you've got going on. I don't know where you're at right now. But I believe there... With this many people in a room, there's got to be some demonic influence going on. There's got to be some people struggling with stress, with depression, with nightmares, with addiction, with marriage issues. There's got to be people that call themselves followers of Jesus sitting in this room right now that are fighting even health issues. There's a spirit of infirmity. There's a spirit, a demonic spirit that causes health problems. So we're going to see if anybody wants to use their key this morning. Because Jesus gave you the key to get rid of the junk that's going on in your life. He gave you the keys to get rid of it. You're like, Rick, I don't don't know what to do. Here's what we're going to do. We're just going to pray. And you're going to command it to come out in Jesus' name. Now here's here's the weird part. Here's the part. I believe demons can't hear your thoughts. You're going to tell it out loud. Some of you are like, this is the goofiest thing, Rick, I've ever heard of. Okay, go ahead and leave and take your demon with you. But I'm all about the people staying here and the demons going. Not the people going and the demons staying. And you're like, is this really real? Yes, it's really real. I was preaching one night, I'm in the back of the room, the band was playing, and they're on the last song, and I'm getting ready to walk up and start preaching. And God said, don't you dare walk up there and preach, you've got a spirit of rebellion, get it out of you before you go up there. And I'm like, that was not me. Well, I just keep on worshiping, and the band's almost done, and he said, I'm telling you, do not walk on that platform and preach my word with that spirit in you. And I said, in the name of Jesus, spirit of rebellion, rebellion, you come out right now. And I went, ah! And the band went, amen. And I went up on stage and started preaching. This is real, people. This is not a game. This isn't something we play with. 
This is the supernatural and the natural coming together. And you can either win today or not win today. And some of you are fighting some things. You're fighting depression. You're fighting autism. You're fighting cancer. You're fighting colds. You're fighting all kinds of stuff right now. And it can be done today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for that scripture that he said we can forbid things here on the earth and they will be forbidden in the spiritual realm. Father, we thank you for the keys where you said in Luke chapter 10, I give you all authority to have dominion over the devil and his demons. We claim that authority right now for our lives, for our homes, for our family, for our marriages, for our jobs. And we say, Satan, in the name of Jesus, leave right now. Whatever that spirit is that's holding on, you let go right now. Release in Jesus' name. You tell it, just say, go in Jesus' name. I'm done with you. I'm not messing around anymore. And Father, I thank you right now for the anointing that's in this place to break the yoke, to break the bondage. And Lord, I thank you that people are leaving here set free. They're going to feel lighter. No more heavy burdens in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you that people are going to leave here and tomorrow morning they're going to wake up and go, hey, my cold's gone. My sickness is gone. I thank you that people are leaving here changed today because of the power of Jesus. And Lord, we thank you for that authority to win. We claim it over our lives. And Lord, I thank you so much for Jesus and that victory that he conquered on the cross for us. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, Joe said if you want to get baptized, we've got one coming up. If you want to get baptized, come talk to me. I'd love to, to dunk you. It'd be awesome. But if you're here and you don't know Jesus, you've known who he is, but you've never had a relationship, you've never walked with him, you've never followed him, come see me. Come talk to one of the band members. Come talk to somebody before you leave today. But don't leave hanging on to this pride anymore.